Well, hello folks and welcome to another episode of Autofocus. Uh, and this week we're going to talk about panel replacement, uh, spot welded panel replacement. Uh, just a general overview of the process, how we would go, go about it, how you might be able to go about it, hopefully give you a few tips and a few pointers. Most of it's things that most people watching this are probably already going to know, but at least if we put it all together in a little video, it might, might help a few people do a few jobs at home. So I've got my trusty notes to keep me on track this time so I don't go off on too many of my usual tangents. So the first thing to do when looking at a panel replacement job. Let's say, on, on, on the extreme example that we're covering behind us here that has sort of prompted this video is, we're actually working on replacing the entire body sides at the moment on this Mark 1 Escort. So the, those being an example, replacement, replacing the body sides, obviously the first thing you need to do is get the replacement panel. Now that goes all the way down as far as even very small panel replacements. If you're replacing a very small section, if it's an entire panel, the first thing to do is get that panel because you need to determine whether it does cover all of the bit that you want to replace, the extents of it, whether it's the right shape, and do a lot of checking. Before you start removing the old panel, the corroded one or damaged one, you need to get the new one first and make sure it's gonna fit and do exactly what you want it to do. And that's much more the case if you're replacing part of a panel, if you're doing a part replacement where you might have, you might have fabricated a part section that's say spot welded around part of its periphery, but then it's gonna be joined at a cut line to an existing part of an existing panel. So in, in, in any of these cases, always fabricate the panel first if you're going to fabricate it or buy the panel first if you're going to buy it first and then verify it's going to fit and make sure that it fits. You'll be able to ascertain that usually over the top of the existing panel to some extent at least, or, or do some measurements if not and just make sure it's going to fit first. That's the first thing to do before you start cutting everything off is get the new bit ready first. So next stage is removing the old panel. So we've got quite a few bits of footage in here on that. The key tools are probably the one that's most used most often uh, and is most important is the spot weld drill, which uh, we've got a couple of zoom ins, I think, on this, but that is a typical eight millimeter spot weld drill uh, in a decent cordless drill. You need a pretty decent one because it'll be pretty busy doing this job. Um, I'm just making sure I'm not banging my mic there. Um, so that's a sharp, that's brand new sharpened drill. These are reasonably expensive, somewhere of the order of £10 each. They're a boron steel, um, high speed steel drill bit. Uh, they, I'd say they're reasonably expensive, but they can be resharpened many times and resharpening them, I forget exactly what we pay. I think it's something of the order of £2.50 a drill bit to resharpen them, which is a lot cheaper than there's somewhere approaching £10 each to buy them near. I think a bit less than £10, but somewhere in that order to buy them. But then, yeah, there's sort of somewhere of the order of £2.50 each to send them away to get them sharpened. Obviously, if you've got your own cutter grinder, brilliant, you can sharpen them yourselves. And if you're very skillful with an angle grinder, you can actually get a couple of sharpens out of them with an angle grinder with a cutting disc, but that doesn't always go too well. You're best off just to buy have quite a lot of these and then send them off in a batch to a man to re get them resharpened, which is what we do. We have probably, I don't know, 30 of them and we just get through them and then when we've got a big batch of them, we'll send them all off for resharpening. So that's the key. That is a way of drilling through and removing spot welds. The key tip with these, with this is watching out, keeping the drill speed down, preferably using some cutting lubricant on it so that it lasts a lot longer, but keep the speed down and the pressure up. If you run it at high speed with not enough pressure, they blunt really quickly. You'll only drill a handful of spot welds before it's blunt. If you keep the speed down, pressure up, you'll drill lots of spot welds uh, before it's blunt. And if you keep some lubricant on it as well, it'll last miles longer and you'll probably be able to drill, you know, a few hundred spot welds with it before you've got any wear on it at all. Um, the, I was going to say something else about a, another key thing for it. Yeah, keeping the speed down, pressure up, uh, lubricant. Uh, ah, the other thing, the pip on the end of the drill bit, which you'll have just seen a minute ago. The, the thing to watch on panels where you want to keep on, on the body sides on this, a classic example on the A pillars. When you're drilling the spot wells on the outside of the A pillar, I wouldn't use this. I'll use something else, which I'll show you in a minute, because that pip on the end of there tends to go through and penetrate the inner panel and show through as a small hole on the inner panel, which you then may, if you want it to look perfect, need to weld up um, afterwards, which kind of defeats the object of the spot welding process and cleanly removing the other spot weld. So that's the thing to be aware of, is that you may end up making a very small hole with the lead, with the centering pip on this drill bit. Um, as you go through the panel flanges. So just be aware of that. Sometimes that means that this isn't the best process. So that's one way of removing spot welds. The other way, which we actually use a lot more, is 
a belt sander, a small belt sander. These are 10 millimeter by 330 millimeter abrasive belts. The one that's on here now is a 3M Cubitron 60 grit belt. Uh, which we generally use for most jobs. Um, we use, well, we use 60 grit belts in that dimension for everything. We use, there are two abrasives we use. We use some 3M Cubitron, we use some Sear, Searbite ceramic. They're both ceramic belts, both very good. I wouldn't like to say which is better. I'd probably say the abrasive wise, the Sear is probably better, but we do have a few belt failures with it on this. The key is a decent belt uh, sander. This is a very old, well, very well used uh, Dynabraid unit. These are quite expensive. These are about the best part of 500 pounds new. You can get much cheaper ones, and at a hobby level, uh, one of the cheaper ones will be fine. The problem with the cheaper ones is they tend to run the belt a little bit slow, and if you run these belts too slow, the abrasive gets peeled off rather than grinding. You should be generating quite a lot of sparks when you're using it. If it's not generating sparks, it's running too slow, and the belts don't last very long at all. But the good thing with these is it's very easy to see grinding away on the spot welds when you get when you break through the spot weld it's very easy to see when you break through the first layer you see it go blue and then flake away so it's very 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 controlled it's a very good way of getting the spot welds off without damaging the underlying layer so of the two processes this is actually probably the more useful if rather messier um, and it's also a lot easier on the arm thing with a spot weld drill you can actually get an air assisted spot weld drill which air clamps which is which works well on flanges when you can get to the back of them it actually has an air operated clamp on it that takes the arm work out of it but keeping the pressure up on the drill is pretty hard work on your arms by the time you've done 100 or so spot welds but with this the effort required is a lot less it's just messy dusty sparky dirty work but it does do a very controlled job of removing the weld so that's the favored tool that's been used a lot more on this particular job behind us than that has so once you've ground those spot welds away or drilled those spot welds out, they will generally all still hang on to some extent. Inevitably, you won't have got all of the weld away or there'll be a little bit still holding on. And in some cases, quite a lot holding on. And also in other cases, you might be removing the panel behind as well, in which, but you still need to split them to get them apart for some reason. Sometimes that happens. In those cases, you can just blast through with a chisel and remove the welds and not worry about either panel. In that case, and in, in order to remove the remains of these welds, the final tool you need is a decent splitting chisel. This type of chisel is very good for that job. Um, I do have another chisel, which is an old um, uh, two-inch brick bolster, which is actually also quite good, uh, which I've ground a slight curve on, so it centers on the spot welds. Um, but this splitting chisel, um, which has removed all the welds on the, um, on the Mark I Escort behind us, and that, that works very well. A very long taper, very slight front, and grind it with with an offset in that sort of manner so that the so the offset is all on one side don't grind both don't grind both sides of the tip of the chisel grind it all on one side leave the other side flat i'll let jamie zoom in on that the reason for that is always put the chamfered side of the chisel against the panel you don't want to damage so when you're chiseling along splitting the welds put the put the angled side of the blade against the panel you don't want to damage if you do it the other way it'll tend to dig in and tear that panel if the spot welds hanging on a bit too well if you put it the other way around so the chamfered sides against the panel you don't want to damage it will prevent it digging into that side and if it does any damage to one side or the other it'll damage the side you're removing that doesn't matter so always put the chamfered side against the panel you're keeping uh, and then yeah lots of hammering and that will remove all your spot welds so that's how to get all of, all of those apart uh, and that's that basically don't try and don't hit your hand too much you will by the time you've removed a whole quarter panel probably have hit that part of your hand quite a few times that's pretty standard standard practice so you've uh, at that point you've chiseled and drilled and ground your way through all the spot welds and got it all clean uh, got it all removed sorry all cleanly removed but what you'll find is there's a few bits of the panel still holding on possibly areas where there's some braze in corners, possibly areas where there's some MIG stitch welds or some bits you can't even see and you don't know how they're held on, but it doesn't really matter because you can cut them off. Um, if you pardon any noise in the background, the weather's turned really stormy, <laughs> the doors blowing, the roller shutter doors are blowing around and all sorts. Um, so anyway, yes, once you get it to that point, you may find that a cutting disc in an angle grinder is needed just to release a few corners and bits where you can't quite see how they're attached or they're brazed. And it, again, just make sure when you do that that you think through any of those cuts first to make sure that you're cutting on the waste side, on the side that you're replacing of the panel joint. It's very easy to go in gung-ho and actually cut the panel that you're trying to keep uh, by accident, trying to 
release a bit that's still holding you back from the success of getting the panel off. So just bear that in mind and make sure you're cutting on the correct side of the joints. So hopefully at that point, your panel will all fall off, ready to go in the skip, and you're now presented with what inevitably is a fairly mangled looking, the reality, and in the ideal world it would be perfect and pristine, and with just a trace of rust here and there, the reality is there'll be quite a few bits where Mr. Chisel has mangled the flanges a little bit and they won't look perfect. Hopefully you haven't ripped any holes in them, Occasionally you do, I think I did in a couple of places on that, but hopefully you haven't ripped holes in them, but in quite a few places, the flanges will be a bit knocked about and a bit of a mess. So at that point, you need the tool which I've failed to bring over here, which is the hammer and dolly. And you'll go round the flanges with a hammer and dolly and just hammer and dolly all of those flanges flat. Ideally, a hardwood block and a decent flat planishing hammer works well because if you're using a planishing hammer on a steel dolly, it tends to stretch the edges as well and make them go floppy. Um, so if you've got a, a hardwood dolly or an aluminium dolly or something soft, basically, then it won't stretch the edges as much. So you could go around with that and then any areas that still won't straighten, then you can go in with a steel dolly or a cast iron dolly and, and just and tidy those up. But basically, hammer and dolly all of the spot weld flanges so they're all nice and straight and flat and not got any bends uh, in as a result of the spot weld removal, get them all to that sort of state. That's the first stage of the re-prep of all the edges for the panel replacement. The second stage is to clean them up. Now, there's all manner of ways of doing that. The best tool for 80% of that work is one of these. It's a strip and clean disc. There are a variety of makes, a variety of prices. The ones we get on quite well with are those, or Norton Blaze, uh, strip and clean disc and they seem to be a very good or rapid strip I think they refer to it the the five star one they're not particularly cheap I think they're off the top of my head somewhere in the region of about eight quid a pop those but they do an extremely good job of cleaning up the uh, the flanges they'll remove slight burrs and little bits of remaining panel um, but and they'll also remove rust really efficiently and really cleanly and they'll clean the metal back to perfectly clean steel around the panel edges. So they're a very good way of rapidly cleaning up all of your panel edges. So what we would tend to do is go over with a mixture of belt linisher and one of those to clean up all the, uh, all the sp previously spot welded edges. And then what I'd do is go over any rust remaining in the panel that would be, is going to be hidden once the new panel is fitted, go over that with the uh, strip and clean disc in it. Obviously that would be fitted to a four and a half inch angle grinder, not, by, not held in your hand. <laughs> I'd go over all those areas of rust, clean, it, clean any corrosion up, generally clean all the inside of the, the hidden areas of the panel, all the hidden cavity that will, be, that will be hidden by the new panel once it's fitted, clean everything up, and then apply an anti-corrosion coating in there. And what we would generally apply here uh, is a, um, a Cellimix product. It's a Cellimix epox uh, epoxy anti-corrosion primer. It's, a, a, it's got a, a lot of zinc, added zinc in it for corrosion prevention. Uh, and it's an epoxy two-part uh, um, primer that we use. And in some cases, I'll spray it on in the inside of these corners. I just rigged up the local the weld fume extraction locally and then just sprayed on uh, with, with very little airflow on my gun just so I wasn't really creating any overspray. I just sprayed on some, uh, sprayed on the epoxy primer on that. But equally, it can just be brushed on. It doesn't really matter. The finish isn't very important. It's inside a panel. So basically, put a, put a, a coating of an anti-corrosion um, product in there and an anti-corrosion epoxy primer is an extremely good way of doing that. There's other ways of doing it, but that's what I would recommend. Works really well. It's not particularly expensive. It does a nice job. So I would get that all over the inside of the area that's going to be sealed in once the panel is replaced. Let that cure. Once it's cured, I then go back over all the spot weld flanges because inevitably you'll have got some epoxy primer on those spot weld flanges and that stuff will not weld through. So I then go back over it with that again to clean up those spot weld flanges again. And then just over the spot weld flanges, I then apply uh, a weld through primer. This is the stuff we use. It's really good. It's not expensive. I can't remember how much it is off the top of my head, but it is relatively cheap uh, and it does a really good job. It's a zinc enriched conductive primer which, will, which can be spot welded through, TIG welded, MIG welded. It's extremely good stuff, works really well. We've used it for years, does, the, does what it says on the tin. Brilliant stuff. So we then put that over all of the edges that are to be welded um, so that we've got epoxy primer, epoxy anti-corrosion primer covering the bulk of the inside of the panel and then that covering the areas that we know we're going to be welding. So that's all then prepared and ready for the, uh, the panel to be replaced. 
So the next stage on is then aligning the panel. Now, the reality is you, what you should have done is done some panel alignment before that stage. And again, in the background, we've got the panels being fitted to some jigs that we used when we dismantled, before we dismantled the car, we built some jigs to hold the panels in the correct locations so that we've got, when, when, when everything had gone and we got a big hole and we were wondering where everything should fit, we've got something to align it to and something that held the door aperture in the right shape in the case of the body sides on this car. So the, the first thing is, um, in terms of alignment, is you probably going back a few steps would be wise in a complicated job to have built some little fixtures and jigs at the dismantling stage to make sure that you know where everything goes when it goes back. And again, referring to the, the Escort, we, we built some um, fixtures that go into the windscreen and the rear window and the boot lid apertures to hold all those apertures in shape and to give us, if we take one side of any of those apertures away at a time, even two sides potentially, but hopefully only one side at a time. If we take that side away one at a time, we've got the other, we can date them that back to the other three sides using that fixture. So it's a good way of holding the reference for those screen apertures correct. Now, it's also handy if you can find some information. Now, for the Escort, there is information floating around online. There's, some, there's a body dimensions chart from the um, workshop manual for a Mark 1 Escort, which gives you some of these dimensions are incorrect. I'd give people a warning. If you do come across this chart on Google, uh, there's a couple of dimensions on here that are completely wrong. So just be aware of that. Um, I seem to recall that the distance from the front companion hole to the rear hole here is shown on here as to the leaf spring hanger hole, and it isn't. It's to a companion hole near the leaf spring hanger, and that's very easy to make the mistake of using the wrong measurement. It, it, it's completely wrong. Um, and there are a couple of other dimensional errors on this, on this sheet, but the screen apertures are correct. Um, so you can double check your fixtures against the dimensions of the screen apertures on a fixture sheet. It's always handy to have this. The other really useful information on here when it comes to fixturing and alignment of panels, when you come to the alignment stage, is it shows the correct orientations of the panels at the weld flanges. Now it's pretty obvious, but sometimes there's an offset. Say so here's the rear window aperture. And this is a section through the pillar at the side of it. And you can see that the flange where the glass rubber goes in there, that both the inner and outer panels are aligned, on their, their return flanges are in line. Now sometimes, very occasionally, not on this car, but sometimes those are not in line, they're stepped. And it's very handy to have these sections shown so that you can make sure wherever you've got panels coming together, you know how they align. It's a very useful reference. You can see in a number of places that just bear that in mind so you can use that as a reference for aligning the panels when you get to that stage. So useful, if you can find it, that sort of information is really handy to have. Most more modern cars, it's very easy to find. For older stuff, quite hard to find, but handily for on a Ford Escort, it is possible to find it. Um, so, so let's say we've, we've dealt with fixtures and jigs at that point. I, I can't really explain how to make those. You kind of have to use a bit of uh, intelligence and, and, and general sort of thought around what you're trying to achieve. We've used bits of angle iron welded to various bits of box section to give us um, datum for where the return flanges on the panels go. But you have to kind of look at what you're trying to achieve once you've finished fitting the panel and then work out a way of making sure you can hold it in that position. That's kind of has to be done based on each job on its own merits. Once you've got to that stage and you know where you're going to be fitting the panel and how you're going to be fitting the panel, you need to be able to hold it in place. And that's where I'm going to walk a little bit closer to camera and look at these sort of things. You can never have enough clamps. Basic, normal, reasonably moderate sort of quality, not terribly cheap ones because they just break. Um, mole grips are probably the most useful tool you'll get. They will clamp more things than any of the fancy clamps. Those are the most useful single clamp you'll own. You can do an awful lot with them, and if a standard set won't work, then you can weld bits onto them to make them more, you weld arms and things onto them to make them do what you want them to do. So if you've got nothing else, lots of sets of mole grips are kit. Um, the next most useful thing are these relatively short, relatively cheap C-grips like this. Those fairly indispensable. You need lots of sets of those, as many as possible. Um, you know, it's one of those things you'll never have too many. We, we've run out doing this car, and we've got mine and Stu's and Tom's all collected together. And that's, I don't know how many sets, at least 40 sets. And we've probably used nearly all, we've probably used, well, we have used all of them. Um, and then 
<laughs> also very useful are the big reach clamps. These are quite expensive and you can make your own sort of cheap imitation versions from sets of mole grips, which is not a bad idea because the genuine ones are quite expensive. But very useful for, in the example of these, for holding on the Escort, for holding the sill, the lower sill to floor joint, you have to reach around quite a long way around the sill and with the jig fixtures done the way we've done them, you also have to reach around the beam that goes again, that gives the sill alignment. So you do need a large clamp like that to reach around. Yeah. We've only got, that's the biggest one we've got, and we've only got one of that, that's Stu's. Um, we, only, we only use that one. We've got some that are slightly smaller, we've got a few of those, but the really big reach one, we've only got one of. And that brings me on to the other really useful thing, which is trusty tin of self-drilling screws, or tech screws as most people would refer to them, and the relevant driver to go in your drill that holds them magnetically in place like that. So then, in the drill, you can drill through, and that will self-drill through the panel and then pull the panels together. So you can clamp and then adjacent to the clamp, drill and screw the panel together, then move your, pan move your clamp along. And the way we would generally do that is to clamp, work out a rough spot weld interval that we want to spot weld along the seam. So we put the clamp on, drill a screw next to it, release the clamp, and then we'd go along two spot welds. And then where the third spot weld would be, clamp, screw again, two spot welds where the third one would be, drill, clamp again, go all the way along. So then when we can go along with the spot welder afterwards, we can spot weld, spot weld, plug weld where the screw was, spot weld, spot weld, plug weld where the screw was, and so on all the way along. So we've got one plug weld filling in the hole that the tech screw leaves. Obviously, stating the obvious here, the tech screws will leave a hole, you need to weld it up. So you would really have to use the MIG welder at that point to fill that hole in. Whereas you'd be, generally, we would always try and aim, and if possible, I'm fully aware that a DIY um, repairer in a garage at home is unlikely to have a spot welder. But let's say that you have, it would be nice, it's always nice to spot weld panels. It's quick, easy, clean. There's a reason manufacturers use spot welders, not plug welding. It's just so much faster and so much cleaner and neater. And there's no grinding off afterwards or anything. So minimizing plug welding if you have a spot welder is beneficial. So using that technique of not putting a screw where every weld will be is quite handy. So that's a way of clamping where it's very difficult to get in with the big clamps or you haven't got enough big clamps or sometimes it's impossible to get a clamp around at all. And that's where the, uh, the, the tech screws are very useful for holding the panels together. So let's say at that point, just checking my trusty list, but I think we've got done uh, everything, everything else there. Oh, ah, one other thing. Wait, I'll be back in two seconds. I'm going to run and get something. There's another clamp, which there's a couple of other clamps which are also useful to mention at this stage. There are, I'm coming back, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. A couple of other clamps that are useful. These, which are um, panel pins. For these, you drill a, a 1 8 of an inch hole through your panel. Uh, and then as you do them up, this pin retracts and it expands the end a bit like a raw plug and pulls the panels together and pulls them against the end of the pin. They're very useful. They're, uh, like a, they're commonly used in the aircraft industry, very useful tool. And then there's a sprung version of that, commonly known as a Cleco, because they were made by a company called Cleco Lock. Um, which is a, the, 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 they work in the same way that you can get them in various diameters, basically the same diameters, imperial diameters as, rivet, as the various rivet sizes, because they're designed to hold panels together prior to riveting. And again, that springs out, and when the spring returns it, it clamps the panel together in just the same way as the screw up type clamp does. Both of those are quite useful for panels where you're planning to put plug welds in and for some reason you might not want to use a tech screw. There could be various reasons, so it's worth bearing in mind those as well. You can get them periodically sort of on eBay or various other places as aircraft uh, maintenance workshop surplus quite cheaply. So it's worth looking out for sort of used ones from aircraft maintenance places. They're very useful to have. Very good for doing aluminium fabrication of quite precise jobs as well, away from the welding, the spot welding panel repair that we're talking about. They're quite useful for just holding small aluminium fabrications together while you plan how you're going to do the next part or to hold them all together for mock-up before welding or riveting, obviously, hence why they go through a rivet hole. So useful clamps to have as a little aside there. So we've clamped, we've, we've fixtured our panels into place somehow. Could be the crude as you like, could be a really nice fixture, however you want to do it. We've then clamped everything in place, made sure it all fits got prepped edges, we've got weld through primer on all the edges, everything lines up, we've made sure that doors fit and that boot lids fit and 
floors fit and that seats fit and whatever the million and one other things that might be needing to fit in the space where you've replaced this panel on whatever car you're working on make sure all of that's done as with all these things it's all in the preparation not in the actual doing of the job it's all in the thinking it through and making sure it's going to go right first so you've done all that you've prepped everything you've made sure it's all going to work panels clamped in place now you've got to fix it in place so over to welding here we have two bits of welding kit this is our newer welder which is still quite old in the scheme of things but it's newer to us um, it's a V-Lander and Schill uh, inverter spot, as it says. This, is, obviously, is a spot welder, uh, <laughs> to, to state the uh, blindingly obvious. Um, it, that's the spot weld gun. They're the two electrodes, they're the tips. The tips on these are replaceable. Uh, they're very cheap. Uh, they're, they're about 70 pence each. Um, they're, they're replaceable and they're available in a variety of forms on the ends. So they're, they're very cheap and easily replaceable. And these arms and the tips are fed with uh, cooling water, which is fed to a refrigeration unit in the bottom of the welder. And that keeps all of that cool. And it also cools the power lines coming from the machine to here. And it also, control, it also cools the uh, semiconductors within the welder itself, because all of them get very hot. Um, and they get hot because it's designed, I mean, the, uh, uh, more modern spot welders deliver a lot more than this, I hasten to add, but they get hot because it's designed to deliver up to 9,000 amps to the spot weld tips. So it's quite a lot of power. And delivering that even for very short bursts. I mean, the setting we're on at the minute, it's on 68%, so 68% of 9,000 amps, whatever that is, I'm not going to do the maths now, for 0.21 of a second is the setting it's on there. And obviously, as we change the settings, those numbers will change, but that's what it's set to at the minute. I think a minute ago, we were spot welding on about 70% power and about 0.45 of a second. That's an awful lot of energy delivered very, very quickly to here. And that puts a huge amount of heat into the unit. So that's why it has water cooling on it. These arms are interchangeable with lots of other arms. Um, there, are, there are a whole number of different shaped, different types of arms for the machine with different reach ends, different style ends for reaching into different places. And then they go up to particularly large ones for reaching a long way around things. So the, all these arms will interchange into the ends of the, the gun on there and enable, enable welding in all sorts of different locations. Um, so that's one type of spot welder, uh, a fairly expensive one and one that's unlikely to be for sort of DIY use but it's pretty indispensable if you're doing a lot of spot welds. The water cooling is the thing that means you can actually do quite a lot of welds. We, we, without the water cooling, the, the limiting factor comes, it becomes very quick. Uh, they, they, you, you just, you just the, everything overheats. You can't, you can't cool the machine enough. You can't cool the gun, you can't cool the tips, you can't cool the cables. Uh, and you just have to do, you probably do sort of say 10 welds on a, on a sill. You might do 10 welds with a non-water cool machine then have to stop for half an hour, let it cool down. So that's one of the benefits of the water cooling. The other key with this machine is this, is a compressed air cylinder. And you can adjust the clamping force by air pressure on this machine. And the air, the air cylinder is what actually closes that gun. And it puts enormous pressure on these tips, obviously a lot more on the short arms than on the long arms, but it puts enormous pressure on the weld tips, uh, which retains the weld in the joint, prevents it from blowing out. If you uh, don't have enough pressure on the tips, uh, either the, the, the weld won't be held together enough to actually weld at all, or when the current's passed in, the uh, weld nugget, the, the piece of molten material that's within the uh, weld seam will blow out of the side and it'll just blow a hole in the panel. Either way, that's bad. So the, having a huge amount of force delivered to those tips to retain the weld nugget is very important, and that's what the air cylinder does in here. That's a very important piece of uh, equipment, really. And then the, the alternative was uh, our non-water-cooled, non non-air-operated welder. This is going back a little bit more, is uh, an older uh, Tetna machine, <coughs> which we also use, and we have used a lot in the past. On this, the gun is manually operated, as you can see. And when it's fully closed, it flicks a switch, which passes the energy to the, uh, to the weld tips. This is 7,000 amp. Um, and the problem with this machine is that everything from the machine to here gets extremely hot very, very quickly. The, be the benefit with this machine is it's easier to customize the, the tips on the weld arms. And, we've got, and, the, and the weld arms are massively cheaper than the water-cooled ones. So the benefit to this is we can customize the ends to do all sorts of jobs where the accessibility might not be there for the bigger water-cooled items. 
So for, <coughs> pardon me, for example, welding roof gutters, we can make the electrodes very narrow. Obviously, we wouldn't be using these arms, we'd be using a different set, but we can grind these electrodes very narrow so that we don't risk burning the edges of the gutters. Uh, and we can, we can grind all sorts of shapes onto the electrodes to do a variety of sort of more specialist jobs. And we can bend the arms to reach into places. We, we can basically customise everything from there forwards without spending vast sums of money with this welder. Whereas with that one, the, the cost of the arms means that you pretty much buy the arms and they're the ones you've got. Um, you, you, you're much more limited with that machine. Whereas with this, we can, we can, we can customise it to do all sorts of random jobs. Um, so it just, just brings a bit more flexibility to things. Um, and certainly the, the, this type of, this Techna type of machine is a much more affordable machine. You pick one of those up for between three and 500 pounds, maybe a little bit more for a slightly newer one, but for, for an air-cooled um, 7,000 amp spot weld machine like that, you can generally get them for sort of between three and 500 pounds. You can buy 240 volt ones, that's a split phase one, that runs on two 240 volt phases out of a three phase, so it's 415 volt split phase, that one is full three phase. Um, you can buy um, 240 volt transformer gun style machines where the, the gun with the handle and the electrodes is actually also the transformer and they just plug into normal 240 volt supply. They're normally a lower amperage but would do for a lot of DIY type stuff. You know, you can do some good work with those machines um, as well. That's not to sort of decry their use, but they're a lot less flexible. Um, so yeah, you know, if you were getting serious and you have got a three phase power supply, because you need three phase to be able to run this split phase machine, then these are reasonably affordable. And the other benefit to those, well, to either of these machines is they can do um, panel repair type work where they, you can use them as a, a pin pulling machine, something we'll probably cover in another episode. And we've actually got another Techno machine that we use for that type of work. And also stud welding, welding on, I mean, this machine has a, a separate gun for, for that purpose here. Um, so you can weld on threaded studs, trim clips, a whole variety of other things, little widgets that you might want to weld onto car body panels can also be done with the spot welders. So they have other uses as well. Um, we'll perhaps cover some more on that on another, uh, on another episode. But yeah, they're the, they're the two bread and butter machines for attaching panels together in the sort of format you can see behind us there. Uh, obviously this one doing the, the, the vast bulk of the work. We've actually just done a little job with this one um, in the rear corners of the rear scuttle panel, I guess you would call it, at the bottom of the rear screen. There's a couple of um, spot welded seams underneath by the boot hinges there that we can't access with that welder, whereas we can just access it with this one. So we've used, the, used those long, long arms that were on that gun just a minute ago, that you just saw a minute ago. We've used those to access a weld seam in there that was inaccessible with that one. So yeah, that's hopefully summarised a reasonable amount around, um, around how to do a panel replacement. Obviously, that's an extreme example because we're replacing most of it. Um, but, but you can condense that down to being a very small panel, just, just a single patch panel somewhere um, on, on any spot welded steel type construction vehicle. Um, it's, it, the, all, the process is basically the same. The removal process, the cleanup process, the prep process, the alignment process, and the welding process is largely the same for any of those things. So hopefully that's been of some use to somebody out there and uh, we'll, we'll keep firing out these videos and hopefully somebody will find them useful. Right, well, following on from all that panel replacement, uh, I thought we would just do a quick cover of a few questions that came up on the last autofocus episode. So I've gone, done a very uh, technical paper list this time instead of trying to look at them on my phone. <laughs> so we will start with uh, Stuart Penketh uh, had asked a question on how I would put a car body on the frame jig Whatever, um, if I didn't have any manufacturer information in terms of datums and positions, with difficulty is the quick <laughs> is the quick answer to that. But it is doable generally. It depends how damaged the car is. We've had a couple of vehicles that we've worked on where they were incredibly heavily corroded and heavily crash damaged, and it basically it becomes archaeology. You have to, if I, you, you get the body shell loosely thrown on the jig resting on wooden blocks is how, the way we would do it, sort of basically balance it on there in a sort of semi-sensible semi position. Um, position it as centrally as you can in both longitudinal and side to side. 
uh, and just rest it on blocks and then go around it and find the bits that you perceive are not damaged. There has to be some assumption about that. First find the bits that you perceive are not damaged and get them in sort of what appears to be initially sensible locations. And then look at the bits of car and perhaps look at, if it was really severely damaged, perhaps look at photographs. If you've definitely not got any information and it's impossible to find, obviously it's very rare that it's impossible to find because you can go and find a car, uh, find an example of a car that isn't damaged and get the information from that. Particularly now with a 3D scanner, you can scan a car that isn't damaged to get the information from. However, if all that fails and you've got the only one of something, then you could look at some photographs. Normally there's a photograph online or a photograph somewhere of one, and you can say, well, yes, at ride height, the sill on that car is parallel to the ground. So we'll set this up with the sills parallel to the ground. Now, if one's not parallel to the other, you have to, which was the case in the car I'm thinking of, uh, the example in my head that we worked on, uh, then you have to pick a side of the car that you think is right, line that sill up parallel to the jig, and then start working from there. So you basically, you just have to go around the vehicle, pick all the points that you think are correct, and you have to make educated guesses on what's correct. Uh, and, and once you've made those educated guesses on what's correct, get those points held in place, make fixtures to fit those, and then adjust all the points you, that by, by, by that point have assumed are not correct to get them to the correct place. So you, you make your fixtures based on the ones that are correct. Normally you can find one example of each sort of half of the car that's right in for each particular area of the car. And on that basis, you can then create a fixture set based on pretty patchy information on how the car should be. We've done it in the past, pretty successfully on, on a couple of examples where we've had no information at all and an extremely badly crash damaged car, half of which has dissolved, and still managed to come up with what we thought was a pretty good fixture set. And after doing it, all the suspension went on, the wheels pointed in the right directions, everything leveled up, the door, you know, everything worked on the car and it all looked correct. Whether it was to manufacture spec, who knows, but it certainly appeared correct. So that's how we would tackle that one. Um, time side steel erectors. Uh, referred to do we use wax oil specifically wax oil or anti-corrosion cavity treatments on cars that have had the zinc metal spray and uh, Upol Raptor process yes we do uh, basically anywhere we can't treat with a sprayed coating be it the metal spray or Raptor or paint anywhere that we can't treat so any hollow sections are all wax injected as soon as we've got through the um, the sprayed coating stage so once that's all done so we know we haven't got to put any more paint on so we don't cause issues with that then we wax inject everything all, all, all the hollow sections are sprayed with wax oil we actually use wax oil we don't use, there's no magic to it you know basically anti-corrosion wax is in my unless i'm going to be re-educated by somebody there's not a lot dif of difference between them to my mind anyway i mean dealt with a few the basic function of them all is the same there's minor differences in viscosities and the methods of application and things like that but we get on just fine with good old-fashioned wax oil we thin it down a bit with white spirit where we need it to penetrate into things a bit more we don't if we don't we apply it heated uh, and we've got various lances and things for applying it into cavities so yeah we, we use good old-fashioned clear wax oil and spray it into all the hollow sections with with various spraying equipment uh, moving on, Matt Davis asked if we have a body shell that wasn't in correct alignment once we've got it on the fixtures, how would we get it into correct alignment? Do we have the kit to do that? Yes, we do. I was going to get it out, but it's kind of buried behind a load of other things. We have a select dozer uh, with a 10 ton ram on it uh, and the air operated pump to drive that and various sets of chains uh, and wires and hooks and pulling clamps and a whole myriad and rollers and various other things to enable us to pull things to shape. And yes, that's a job we have done quite a bit. A number of cars we've worked on have needed pulling straight prior to us doing any further operations on them. It's not uncommon. Um, and with a manufacturer-based, data-based fixture set, it's quite easy to see where the errors are and pull the car back. And, they generally, yeah, a dozer soon, soon adjusts things to shape. If you're not sure what I mean by um, a select dozer, then if you Google select dozer, it will come up. Obviously, other manufacturers make them. There are a number of manufacturers of dozers, but if you look up select, C-E-L-E-T-T-E, -E -E, uh, dozer on Google, then you'll find, you'll, you'll see what it is without me having to get it out of our sort of storage area at the back there, because it's not something we use very often. Um, 
the uh, user by the name of Not Me had, questioned, had asked whether we had any experience of using cleaning lasers. I don't have personal experience of using a laser cleaning system. However, I have enough experience of seeing other people using laser cleaning systems to know that they're not really of any benefit to me here. Uh, I can see certain circumstances where they could be useful, particularly in clean industries like boiler making maybe, and in you know, basically more precision fabrication, clean environment fabrication uh, environments, they might be useful. For what we do, hopeless. Um, I mean, interestingly, uh, I watched a video from a fairly well-known TV mechanic, uh, mentioning no names, on YouTube recently using a cleaning laser to clean a Range Rover Classic chassis. Um, and that was a very good example of why you don't want to use a cleaning laser, because to clean that chassis to a far higher standard than it could have been cleaned by that cleaning laser, uh, I, we could do that in around two hours with our blasting setup. Uh, and I would say it probably would have taken nearer to two days using the laser setup. So, and the finish is still not suitable for applying coatings over once that's finished. As far as I could see, it had left an oxide track over the surface that had been cleaned, which would all need removing prior to any other coating being applied. It had blued the surface up with oxide on the steel. So the reality is, you know, blasting is night and day better and infinitely cheaper so just stick with blasting <laughs> uh, Michael Dobson uh, had asked about do we do have a homebrew measuring system or basically measuring systems on our jigs uh, we do have a measure we actually have a select measuring system albeit it's kind of all in storage at the minute there's some of it in there and there's some of it lurking there and there's actually a bit of it outside um, which probably isn't the right place to be keeping it we don't use it very often it doesn't really have that much use for the type of work we do we generally want to fixture a body shell into a known position or make sure it's in that position before fixturing it so ultimately we need to fit, put it on fixtures it's very rare that we would just be putting a car on a jig and then measuring it to check it was all in the right place um, which is generally more what you would use the measuring system for we have used it in the past and we very occasionally do use it and we have it select terminology for it for the old um, mechanical measuring system which, which is what ours is was called the metro 2000 measuring system very old now but works works a treat without a, a proper laser measuring system it works perfectly but we don't really use it very often what we tend to find is that a self-leveling crosshair laser gives us is flexible enough to check any of the measurements we need to check when we need to check them uh, and it can be put away it doesn't take up any space and with the jigs being all set with a machine uh, level absolutely level then we know that with a self-leveling laser we can check everything anyway with a self-leveling crosshair laser we can check any dimension we want anyway uh, with a with a little laser on a tripod that we can just put down wherever we need it so it's a bit more convenient just using that so that's how we do it really we, we, we occasionally use the metro 2000 system but not very often uh, and finally, uh, Ken Phillips had asked about sound deadening uh, on body shells and what we do and why we do it and what are the benefits, what are the downsides, blah de blah. Uh, we, I think we're going to cover that in a future episode. I think it might be worth, it's probably not worth a whole episode, but we could probably tie it into a couple of other things to do with noise and vibration and harshness, NVH, uh, a bit further on because we're going to try and do this series loosely along the lines of the build process of a vehicle, roughly-ish. Won't necessarily always stick to that, but that's kind of the loose plan. Uh, so further down the series, when we get to that sort of stage in the process, we'll do a bit of covering on what we do for sound deadening. It's a bit of an open subject, that. There's lots of ways of solving the noise and vibration problem, and there's better ways and worse ways, and, and also all the manufacturers of these products will also be pushing theirs as the best in the world, and uh, you know, they'll all be the best in the world by their promotional standards. Um, and it's quite hard to argue against those without doing a lot of testing. So I'm not about to stand here and say somebody's better than somebody else. I'll, I will we'll just say what we use and why we use it without a huge amount of science behind that. Because to be totally honest, we haven't done the science behind that. We've just found something that worked well and stuck with it. But we'll cover that in a future episode. So uh, hopefully that's covered a few uh, of the questions. Oh, and it, uh, Pete Tomasini, it was nice to see your comment. I'm glad you watch our stuff as well. We keep I, I keep uh, in touch with all your stuff on YouTube. So. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> it was good to see you and keep up the good work as well. So, uh, yeah, and that covers it all for this week, I think. So see you again soon uh, once we've worked out what we're, what we're going to do for the next little episode of Autofocus.